You know, the Bible is a book of history, but it's different from every other book of history because it starts earlier and it finishes later than any other history book. It starts at the very beginning of our universe and it finishes at the end of it. You see, the Bible is a romance. It's the story of a father looking for a bride for his son. God the Father looking for a bride for his son Jesus Christ and the bride is us. And there's got to be a wedding. Every romance ends with a wedding and they live happily ever after. He's coming back for his marriage to us. We are his bride. We're at the moment engaged to Christ. That's how Paul puts it. We're betrothed to Christ. We're engaged to be married. An engagement can break. But one day we will be married, and that's the day he's coming back for. But he's also coming back for a big battle. It's called the Battle of Armageddon, and it says a huge army will have gathered, led by the Antichrist, the false prophet, to get rid of Jesus and his followers. It's got to be a huge army because uh, by this time Jesus is not just with 12 disciples, he's with hundreds of thousands who've gathered with him there. And so this great army is there. It's called a battle, but it isn't a battle at all. With one word, Jesus kills the lot of them. But that's the Battle of Armageddon. There's no fighting, really. Jesus, just as he killed a fig tree with a word when he was here on earth, will kill the whole army with a word. But that's a Jesus that isn't meek and mild. Who is this army made up of, David? It's made up of ordinary people who have followed the Antichrist and the false prophet, who are his conscript soldiers who want to serve him who've enlisted or been conscripted, and they are simply out to destroy Jesus and the Christian. Now that has left this huge vacuum. The army has gone. Its two leaders have been thrown into the lake of fire. That's when Jesus takes over for a thousand years. Now we all know the word millennium now. It used to be only heard in church, but now it's heard everywhere outside church and never inside apparently. But it refers to Revelation 20, where six times God says, a thousand years, a thousand years, a thousand years, a thousand years. And the last two, he says, the thousand years, the thousand years. And that's raised this whole question of the millennium, the millennium, not just the year 2000, but this thousand years that is mentioned six times in this single passage. And an awful lot of controversy has come about that. I'm sure you've heard of a millennial, pre millennial, and post millennial. A friend of mine was asked whether he was a pre or post millennial, and he said that is a preposterous question. And a lot of modern Christians duck the issue altogether and just say, I'm pan millennial, meaning everything will pan out all right in the end anyway. But that's ducking the scripture. Here is God telling us six different times about a period of a thousand years. Even if that figure is symbolic, it refers to a length of time, a long period of time. So what happens during that time? And the answer clearly is that the saints are reigning with Jesus on earth. They are the government now. Christians who have prepared for that in their daily work are now taking over the world in the name of Jesus. And uh, the world will finally be seen to what it can be like under good government. It's as if God doesn't want to destroy this world until he's shown us what it could have been like. A final demonstration of his rule, his kingdom, his reign on earth through his son Jesus. Now the Bible is packed with promises of what can happen to this old earth under the right sort of government. It says that health will improve so much that anybody dying at a hundred will be regarded as tragically premature. It means that we go back to the length of life there was in the days before Noah's flood, when Methuselah lived 960 odd years, that life will be healthier, longer. It says that life will be safer. It talks about children playing in the streets again and old people walking the streets of the city without fear. Can you imagine that? And not only will health improve and longer life, there will be peace on earth. And uh, that's very simple. There's a simple reason for that. Why is there not peace? Because there's not justice. And as long as there is injustice, there won't be peace anywhere. And this is the real problem in the world. Who settles disputes and will they be accepted as just? 
I must tell you, David, I went to the United Nations headquarters in uh, New York and there were two things I wanted to see. One outside the entrance in a big lawn is a huge lump of granite and on it is half a verse of the Bible. It's always dangerous to quote a half a verse or even a whole verse out of context, but there's half a verse. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Now that's, that's a quote from two prophets in the Old Testament, Isaiah and Micah. They both said the same thing. And the United Nations hopes that that's going to happen through the work of the United Nations. It never will. But they hope that one day multilateral disarmament will be a fact. But you and I know it's not going to be. Well, that was one thing I wanted to see in the United Nations. The little girl in blue uniform finally said, well, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our tour. Have a nice day. And I said, but you haven't shown us one room. We'd seen the General Assembly room, the Security Council room. But I said, you haven't shown us one room. She said, what room is that? And I told her. And she said, no, that's not open to the public. It's locked. I said, but I want to see it. And so she said, go to one of the guards in the foyer and he might let you in. So I went to this big man with a couple of pistols in a holster. I said, could you show me this room? No, he said, it's not open to the public. I said, but uh, I'd like to see it. Oh, well, he said, no, it's, it's uh, locked up. I said, but I've come all the way from little old England to see it. And he gave way too. And he said, how long do you want to be in there? I said, two minutes. And uh, he said, he got the key. And he took me across the foyer, opened the door and showed me. And it's a room with no windows. It's the prayer room of the United Nations. And in the middle of the room is the God they pray to for world peace. There's a circle of prayer mats and prayer stools all around. And in the middle is what I can only describe as a big black block. I think it's of iron or something. And it's up on a pedestal and all the prayer mats face this big black block, which is supposed to represent all the gods of the world. And it's painted matte black and you look into this, it's a bit like this set, and you kind of look into the black and you're supposed to imagine your God in there. And I thought, I've seen the God of the United Nations. And I thought half a verse of the Bible outside and a big black block they pray to inside. Hopeless. But the Bible promises that one day when the Lord reigns in Zion, he will settle the disputes among the nations and they will multilateral disarmament. It has been said in various circles that the United Nations, of course, is the beginning of the world, of the one world government that yes. will be put into place so that the Antichrist can actually rule. And you know this week there's been a gathering of all the religions of the world in the United Nations in New York to bring it all together. It's happening right now. Anyway, that's another story. Let's get back to the millennium. The millennium. What have we got to look forward to? A world of peace, a world of health, and therefore a world of prosperity when we're not wasting all this money on weapons of destruction. It'll be a wonderful world. Even nature's going to change. It says the wolf will lie down with the lamb so and the lion like will eat straw like the ox yeah. and children will play in the forest safely, even with snakes. Now, is all this just poetry? Is it all just imagination? Or does God mean what he says? I believe that every promise in God's word he will keep. He's kept so many so far. So here we have a transformed old earth. And you'd have thought that everybody would be thrilled to be in such a world, wouldn't you? But no, the most extraordinary thing in Revelation 20 is that God releases the devil at the end of the thousand years, allows him back into this world to do what? Within a very short time, he has thousands of people following him, wanting to get rid of this Christian government. Armageddon is not the last battle of history. There's another one. And we find at the end of a thousand years of peace, prosperity, health, happiness, we find thousands marching with the devil to get rid of the Lord and his government. Jesus will make the laws and we will apply them. And people don't like that. When they want to do what they want, they don't like to be told not to. It's the initial reaction. 
And here we have a thousand years of peace, prosperity, health, all that we said we wanted. And people are ready to believe the lie of Satan. You'd be better off without this government. Don't let him tell you what not to do. Don't let him tell you not to take the fruit of the tree of knowledge. Do you see? Mm. It's the same old thing. So let's just very briefly just recap a little and see what's happening to Satan here. Now, Satan um, has been released for uh, at the end of that thousand millennial yeah. years. Yes, he's been released. How long is he, is he going to be released for? Until this final battle? It says he marches with an army that is as number as the sand of the seashore. And he marches on Jerusalem, the city Jesus loves, to get rid of the millennial government of Jesus. So this is the second time now. Yeah. He's tried it the first time. Well, the Antichrist, the Antichrist and the false prophet, but they're gone. Yeah. They're in the lake of fire. But Satan was only locked up for that thousand years. So he comes back as so another he comes guy. back and he leads an army to get rid of this Christian government. And he doesn't even get there. It says fire from heaven comes down and wipes them out. So there's no battle again. But this time it's not a word from Christ, it's fire from heaven that does it. What intrigues me about the whole thing now, is... Yeah, go on. I was just going to say, what intrigues me about the whole thing is the fact that Satan knows he's lost. I mean, the battle's over now. He knows that. Yeah. He, he's very, very well aware that the battle is over. And he actually knows what's going to happen because he believes this just the same as we do. You know? In fact, let's not kid ourselves. He knows it better than we ever would. So why is he even going to bother? What is the point of even bothering? Why did Hitler go on fighting to the last when he knew it was lost? Just it's it's me. just sheer satanic determination to beat it to the last, to rebel to the last ditch. Um, but I'm afraid now you've introduced a serious subject. Hope we don't finish on it, but we've got to introduce the subject of hell. God doesn't want anybody to go to hell. He prepared hell for the devil and all his angels, said Jesus, for the simple reason that unlike us, angels are immortal. We are mortal, we die. But the angels were created immortal. And when the devil, who is simply an angel who didn't want to live in God's kingdom, rebelled against it and took with him one third of the angels that God had created, one third, it's there in the book of Revelation, chapter 12 again. And he rebelled, took them. We call them demons now, but they're simply bad angels, rebellious angels. Here they are, immortal angels who've been in heaven and still chosen. We don't want to live under God's rule. What is God to do with immortal people? He has to prepare a place for them as well. Just as he's preparing a place for us, he had to prepare a place for them to shut them out of the new universe so they'd never get into it again. And hell is a place that Jesus prepared for the devil and all his angels. The trouble is that if we share their rebellious attitude and refuse to live in God's kingdom and under his rule, we share their fate. And uh, it is tragic to read in Revelation 21 that the cowardly, the unfaithful, the immoral, the liars, their lot is in the lake of fire, the very place where the Antichrist, the false prophet and Satan are now. So what is he to do now? There's only one thing to do to hold the day of judgment and that follows immediately. When he divides the human race right down the middle, even families down the middle, between those who want to live under his rule and those who don't, or to put it in simple language, those who want to live in the kingdom of God and those who don't. And, and we're that's talking again choice. about the people that are obviously left on the earth and we're not talking about the saints here. We're talking about everybody now because it says at that point, everybody is raised from the dead to face judgment. The Christians have had their resurrection and their new body a thousand years earlier. Everybody else at that point comes to life. It even says, and the sea will give up the dead in it. So all those who went down with the Titanic will come back at that point, and many more. 
and all the dead, great and small, now stand to be judged. Does your life and what you have done on earth reveal that you want to live God's way or that you want to live your own way? And God has kept a record of my whole life. The only things not in that record are what he's forgiven. And then it's wiped out of the record. But you know, if God simply presented me with a book with everything I've done and said, even just everything I've said, I'd be damned and I couldn't argue with it. I'd say, you're just, Lord, I'm not fit to live in your new universe. I, I belong to an old polluted world, inside as well as outside. But there's another book going to be opened on that day. It's called The Book of Life. And it's a book about Jesus and it's his life. And that's the only book that would pass on that day. The amazing thing is, that if I have been faithful to Jesus and stayed with him through thick and thin, my name is in his book and I'm under his name. And I tell you on that last day, that's the book I want to be in. Amen. <laughs> but it's those who overcome who keep their names in that book. And that's the serious thing. Now we come to the really good news. A recycled universe, this old earth, is not our permanent home. We have a new earth and a new space around it, mm. totally new. And a voice from heaven says, behold. And that means, look, be astonished, be surprised. In Welsh, look you. It's, it's, it's an astonishing word saying, just look at this, look at this. Behold, I am making everything new. Not just people, everything new. The God who made this old planet and space around us, he's going to make it all over again. The new heaven, the new earth. That's what I'd like to talk about. Well, God created this old one and the universe around it. Uh, he loves making things. He enjoyed making people more than things. And we were the climax, the masterpiece of his creation. Because we're the only part of creation that reflects his image. The only part of his creation that's like him. And you can imagine how sad he feels about what's happening to this world. And how badly it's all gone wrong. In fact, at one point he got so fed up with it, he decided to wipe it all out. Or at least wash it out of his hair. Noah's flood. And then he promised never to do that again until the end of the world. And he hasn't been amazingly patient with the way we've treated each other and him and the creation in which he put us. But he does plan to make it all again and to keep it unpolluted the next time and to make a new planet Earth and a whole new space around it. And he wants to put us in it, recycled people who will not pollute it again. That's his objective. But he can't force us to be recycled. We have to allow him to recycle us. And the day of judgment is really about who's allowed themselves to be recycled, who's ready for my new universe. And many will not be ready, and some will be. Jesus said many will not, but few will be. But he wants people from every kindred and tribe and tongue represented. He wants an international community of people who are recycled and ready to look after that new universe properly. That's our destiny. So his whole plan of salvation includes the universe, not just people. He wants the whole thing new and right. And so at the beginning of Revelation 21, we have this description of a new heaven and a new earth, that the old one have gone. They've even gone before the day of judgment. But now is a, a new one being made again and people who have allowed themselves to be recycled by Christ are going to be in it. And it's going to center on this planet. The key to the last few pages of the Bible is that the new earth is our final destiny, not heaven, the new earth. God made the earth. It's the focus of his love. It's where he sent his son. It's where he put us. And he hasn't changed his mind about that. He's creating a new earth for the people who have become new in Christ. And so the earth is the focus of it all. There's going to be a magnificent city which will be the metropolis of the new earth 
and it's described as the new Jerusalem, not the old one, a new one. Talk about men building a city out in space. This is exactly how it's described, that God has a city. He's the architect, he's the builder, he's building it up there, but he's going to send it down here and plant it here, and it's a big one. It's, uh, it would just fit inside the moon if the moon were hollow. It would stretch from Warsaw to Paris, planted on it's that big. And one of the things I'm fascinated to see is the architecture of it, because it will be human scale. Uh, I'm a bit of an architect in my spare time. I design churches and houses, but I've studied new cities like um, Brasilia in Brazil and Canberra in Australia. And it's interesting, when they've built these brand new cities, they've always dammed up a stream so they get a river running through the middle of it. That's straight from the Bible, actually. The New Jerusalem has a river running right through the middle. But he sees, John sees, lying in prison, he's getting all these visions and seeing the future. He sees the New Jerusalem come down out of heaven. What a privilege to be. It's it's Actually coming, seeing it all. coming to earth, and he sees this the huge dimensions of it, 1,500 miles cubed, and how the divine architect can make that human scale so that it feels like home. Yeah. That's the biggest problem of architects with new cities, how to keep it human scale, with skyscrapers and huge buildings. How do you keep it to be a home for people? And God will have solved it. I once said in a meeting, I'm dying to see how God solved that problem. And somebody said, you will, David, you will. Is this all to <laughs> Meaning do you'll then, die to see it. Is this all to do then with, um, in my house there are many mansions? Yes. This is what you Jesus see, is Jesus referring to. Jesus is even now getting it ready for you. Yeah. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. Uh, I hope it's not irreverent to say he seems to have gone back to carpentry. Because, you know, he spent 18 years on earth, making doors and window frames and things. And now he's preparing a place for us, creating a new place. And uh, it comes down to earth and is planted here, a city that is godlike. And the most amazing thing is that God himself moves in. At the end of the Bible, we don't go to heaven to be with God forever. He comes to earth to be with us forever. It's he who moves house. And this is why, again, the angel in <coughs> Revelation 21 says, Behold, look, look, the dwelling place of God is with men. And he's going to live with them. And they will be his people and he will be their God. Not, look, all the people are going to be with God. No, God is moving in with us. And that is amazing. It even says we shall see his face. The face of the Father will be as near as that. And Christ will be there too. In other words, we will be living with God on earth and brand new earth. And of course, this, this is full cycle because right at the beginning of the Bible in the Garden of Eden, Adam heard the sound of God taking a walk in the evening in the garden. God was here then, the Father. Now, he hasn't been here since. He sent his Son here. He sent his Spirit here. But God stayed away from this old polluted world at the end of the Bible, in the new earth with new people, recycled people in a recycled planet earth. He comes and lives with his people there. And that's our destiny. The and no earth. sun. No sun. So it must be the radiance of God that keeps Absolutely, it because God is light. Yeah. And wherever he is, it's just glorious light, no shadows, no darkness at all. And so when God is there, then just a blaze of light, pure light. We're not discussing academic things here. We're discussing my future, your future, yeah. the future of our world. Our heritage. So it does matter. Yeah. Let's pray. Amen. Father, we've been talking in your presence and you've heard every word that's been said. Yes, Jesus. I pray now that if I've said anything that isn't your truth, will you please blot it out from our memories before it does any damage? But if I've been speaking your truth, will you please confirm it by your Holy Spirit so that people will know it's not from me, it's from you, it's from your word. Pray that you'll help them to search your word and see if these things are true. Thank you, Lord, that the truth sets us free. I want to thank you, Father, that you've prepared things for us, wonderful things that nobody has seen or heard or even imagined, but you've prepared them for those who love you. 
and those who are faithful to you. Thank you for sending the Lord Jesus to make all this possible. Our, our imagination has been stretched so far that, Lord, one day we'll understand it all. Until we do, help us to trust you. Even when the times get bad, when things get worse, may we just go on trusting you, knowing that you've got good things ahead for us. Especially, I pray, for people who've got a wrong fear of the trouble, but don't fear you as they should. Lord, may the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom, the fear of judgment, help to keep us straight and keep us on that narrow way that leads to life. So thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to talk together, and we give you all the glory and the thanks. In Jesus' name, amen.